chapter 2. The sweet psalmist David writes, Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together and the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. We know that this is a psalm of David. And you'll remember that the psalms are Hebrew poetry, but they are songs that were meant to be sung. <laughs> I remember teaching Psalm 1 and, and saying, you know, I grew up with a bunch of different people who are definitely musically gifted. There was only one thing that kept me from being a famous musician. I have no talent whatsoever. <laughs> but a lot of people don't let talent stand in their way. This Psalm has four, count them, four voices. It's kind of a supernatural quartet. The first voice is the sweet psalmist of Israel, David. You will hear his voice singing in verses 1 through 3. The second voice is the voice of God Almighty. This is Jehovah. We hear his voice in verses 4 through 6. The third voice is the Messiah's voice the anointed voice. This is the voice of Jesus. We hear his voice in verses 7 through 9, and the final voice is God's Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit offers instruction to the hearers in light of all that's been said and all that's been sung in verses 10 through 12. And so in this psalm, David will ask the age-old question of why do the leaders and the rulers of this world rage against God and reject God's authority, God's sovereignty, God's majesty, his right to rule the people of the earth? And of course... This rebellion began with Satan and continues with the world's leaders who imagine a world apart from the God of the Bible and apart from his Messiah. So David asks the age-old question of, again, why is this happening? The world and the people in the world will often ask the question, what gives you the right to rule or what gives you the right to tell me how to think, how to act, how to behave? Who has the right to rule? And even from early childhood, children can be seen speaking to one another. Who made you the boss of me? You can't tell me what to do. Who is the ideal leader? Who is the rightful king. And this psalm is a coronation psalm celebrating 
the inauguration and coronation of David as king, but as you can imagine, the world around him isn't happy with God's choice to rule the people of Israel. And so the psalm begins with a description of the nations raging against God and God's choice, the Messiah, the rightful ruler. And so the son has received dominion from his father and the son will subdue and subjugate all opposing forces. And the order is indicated in the psalm with words like, inheritance in verse 8, and possession in verse 8, and blessed in verse 12. So the psalm describes the folly, the foolishness of rebellion, and the wisdom of submission to God, of placing yourself in humility under the authority of the rightful king of the universe and the rightful king of the earth and the rightful king of your heart. The occasion, like I said of the psalm, probably is the coronation of King David. In the spirit, in the spirit David sees not just his own kingdom, but a kingdom of a future Son, the son of David. I imagine the events of this psalm in part taking place under the occasion of the celebration of the coronation of David, but I also see it as a prophetic reminder of what's going to take place in the not too distant future when the united nations of the earth stand in rebellion and opposition to the God of the universe and the king of this earth in a time of great tribulation. And during this time of great tribulation, the nations and the people of those nations will be faced with two choices. Rebellion or reverence. And so look at the beginning of the, of the psalm again. The nation's stubborn plan to reject God's Messiah. We hear the voice of David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. So do the nations include Jews and Gentiles? I suspect so. What would cause the nations to think that such a rebellion could ever actually succeed. You know, we've written an article at gotquestions.org. The article is entitled, What in the World, How in the World, Why in the World Would Satan Believe He Can Ever Defeat God? What is going on inside of an individual's heart where they think that they can successfully Reject God. The planned rebellion is futile and foolish. So the rebellion is a planned conspiracy. And there are several important things that we can glean from this passage about the world's thoughts and imagination in this planned conspiracy. That word translated plot or plot a vain thing the word plot it has a different translation in, in, uh, or a different translation in, in Psalm chapter 1. In Psalm chapter 1, the psalmist contrasts and compares the unrighteous and the righteous, the ungodly and the godly. He points out that the godly meditates on the Lord's law, his revelation day and night. The word translated meditate in, in chapter in, in Psalm 1, is translated plot in Psalm 2. Exact same word, different context. 
but the idea is that the godly man or woman uses his or her imagination to reflect, to consider, to examine the things of God, and the ungodly use their imagination, their gifts, their callings, in short, to find a way to reject God, to walk away from God. And so in a real sense, this contrast and comparison I suspect has to do with the fact that human beings are made in the image of God. They're gifted by God. And some people use the tremendous talents and gifts that God has given them to call people to Christ, to lead them to Jesus, to present the gospel. Others have an extraordinary ability to walk away from God, deny God, and then search for alternatives to God. We might think of the people plotting a vain thing as using their considerable gifts in a premeditated way to rid themselves of God, to try and figure out a way to live without God, And that simple but stark contrast separates the godly man and woman from the ungodly man and woman. And so the Lord's enemies are reflecting, meditating, considering, plotting, and planning. How am I going to live my life without God? How am I going to reject God's right to rule in my life and in my heart? The next important phrase is found in verse 2. The kings of the earth set themselves. That expression, set, means to take a stand or to take one's stand. We might think of this as the nations are establishing a position. They're initiating a policy of rebellion, of disobedience. It's a kind of rebellion that isn't just simply taking place from the top down, but from the bottom up. The Lord's enemies reflect on how they're getting rid of God. The next important phrase is in verse 2 again, the kings of the earth set themselves, and even in that statement in the book of Acts chapter 4, verses 25 and 27, Luke, Dr. Luke, in the inspired record, places the words again in the mouth of David saying, why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. The word anointed in the psalm is the Hebrew word Messiah, Mashiach. In the Greek, the word is translated anointed or Christ, the one who is the Christ. And then in Acts chapter 4, verse 27, it says, For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together in verse 28 of Acts chapter 4. It says, To do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. In other words, Luke placing in the mouth of the people when the Jewish leaders have told Peter, James, and John not to preach in the name of Jesus. It's in that context that he says, you decide whether or not we should obey God or whether or not we should obey human beings. And then they quote this psalm. They quote this psalm knowing that we're living in a world that rejects the plan of God, the gospel of God, the Savior that God has appointed and anointed. The nations determine that they've had enough of God. They don't want anything to do with the God of the Bible. And by the way, this doesn't mean that the nations reject religion. The nations are all too happy to embrace a religion that includes a a religion of the self, of materialism, of pleasure, hedonism and materialism and personal pleasure is 
all on board with the nations of the earth. I want to draw your attention to a third thing. Rulers take counsel together against the Lord. That could be translated, the rulers have gathered by appointment. Or another way of thinking about this passage is that the nations have decided in a kind of unanimity, in a unanimous fashion, to formally and firmly get rid of the Bible. And I am going to suggest to you that more and more there's going to be a collective opposition to the person of God and the things of God, most particularly the God of the Bible. The famous Russian dissident Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who won a Pulitzer Prize for his book, Gulag Archipelago, was awarded the famous Templeton Prize, and in his address, he practically screamed to the audience, the world has forgotten God. He laid on the lap of atheism and secularism and the disconnect of civilization from the God of the Bible and what it means to be an image bearer and the problem of sin and the need of a Savior. He placed on the world the burden that once you reject God, once you embrace the idea that human beings are not made in the image of God and that sin is not real and that you don't need a Savior, then you're free to do anything you want. But because human beings are made in the image of God and because they're hardwired to believe in God, most people don't, who reject the God of the Bible don't reject any and all gods. The default position is to make themselves God. That they become the king or the queen of their own life. The human soul is hardwired. It's almost impossible, I think, perhaps I think it is impossible to suppress the knowledge of God. And Paul, writing in Romans chapter 1, will make the argument that human beings might think or suppress the knowledge of God, but they never do it in an effective way. Atheists claim there is no God, but in their hearts something says, you're lying to yourself. You're lying to yourself. I once heard a woman say, I don't believe in ghosts, but I'm afraid of them. You laugh for good reason. What kind of a person says, I don't believe in ghosts, but they're afraid of them? And why is it that the people who claim to not believe in God fear him and fear his judgment? In verse 3, you'll notice that the focus is twofold. In verse 3, the psalmist says, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. Before that, it says, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. In, In other words, here we see something very, very interesting, and that is, hatred, the, the, the rebel, the rebellion, the person in rebellion, the focus is they hate the person of God and then they hate the precepts of God. The rebellion is against the Lord and his anointed in verse 2, the Messiah. The plan is to throw off the yoke of bondage. When Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light, The rebel says, no, it isn't. Your yoke is hard. You are asking me to be like Jesus, and you are asking me to act like Jesus, and I can't do that. And our right response needs to be, you're exactly right. Human beings apart from the Spirit of God and forgiveness in Jesus and the presence of God by the Holy Spirit in your heart are incapable But once you put on Jesus, his yoke is easy. His burden is light. 
The hated thing is the spiritual and the moral and the ethical teachings of the Bible. The God of the Bible is repugnant to the sinner. And the law of the Lord is repulsive and repugnant. Satan hates God and hates God's Messiah and hates God's Word. And the human rebel joins Satan and says, I hate him too. I hate his plan and I hate his revelation. The law of God aggravates and then activates the sin nature and is repugnant to the rebellion human heart. And the fallen man finds an ally in Satan and sees rebellion as his best option. And so the psalmist predicts a world where the nations will no longer submit to God. They won't resist the devil. They won't resist the restraints of their own fallen, broken condition. And so the stage has been set for human beings to worship the creation rather than the creator as it's talked about in Romans chapter 1. And so the nations will, there will come a time when the nations will fully and finally reject what the Bible says about creation, what the Bible says about the condition of human beings, about the fall and sin. They will reject what the Bible has to say about sin and what the Bible has to say about grace and what the Bible has to say about mercy and what the Bible has to say about true love. The nations will abandon the biblical teaching on the sanctity and the dignity of what it means to be a human. They'll abandon what the Bible says about the sanctity of marriage. They will abandon sexual purity. They will abandon respect for authority. They will abandon parental rights. And eventually, it will become very, very important to them that you not be allowed to say that Jesus is Lord and that he saves sinners. Religious freedom will be seriously curtailed. The rebellion will focus on a universal hatred for God and for God's Messiah and God's law. And then you're going to see atheism thrive and secularism thrive and selfism thrive thrive and materialism thrive and woke activism thrive because it's preparing. All of this is a preparation for the final rebellion. Ladies and gentlemen, this is just the beginning, what you're experiencing. This is not the end. There are people. There are people who believe that they can only really be free if they're free from the God of the Bible and the Savior in the Bible. That they can only be fulfilled personally if God isn't a part of their life or Jesus isn't a part of their life. By the way, Christians and the Holy Spirit are serving as a temporary restraint. Your presence, your very presence, is retarding the process of rebellion and corruption. Yeah. And by the way, when you open your Bible, when you tell people that Jesus cares about them, there is something powerful that takes place as people wonder whether or not the Bible is true. So what's the meaning of true freedom? What happens when nations and families and individuals throw off all godly restraints? When I was a younger man, Bob Dylan sang, you got to serve somebody. Yes, indeed, you've got to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody. Throwing off the restraints of God and the God of the Bible doesn't mean that no one is going to be served. 
you get rid of the God of the Bible and then you turn to yourself and your passions and your desires. But eventually the emptiness catches up with you. The Life Application Bible has a helpful note. It says, quote, just as fish is not free when it leaves the water and the tree is not free when it leaves the soil, we are not free when we leave the Lord. Freedom can't come from abandoning Jesus. And so in verses four through six, look what he says. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The voice changes. The psalmist is no longer speaking. Jehovah God is speaking. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. Then he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. And look what he says. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. The holy hill of Zion is Jerusalem and the king is the Lord's anointed. And so the rebellion, the resistance, the disobedience, the Lord's response to the human rebellion, disobedience is laughter. William MacDonald calls humanity's rebellion, quote, stupid insolence, and says, quote, he will mock their clenched fists and fiery slogans. Their boast and threats are the squeaks of a mouse against a lion, unquote. Do you know what it's like? It's like a child who says to mother or father, I'll rebuild the castle. I'll recreate utopia and you realize and you laugh at a child's willingness to do what a child cannot do and remember we live in a world that imagines that they have an exaggerated sense of autonomy and that they can do whatever they please however they please and so what they do is they create a world where they create their own reality and as they're creating their own reality a man can become a woman and a woman can become a man Imagine you're creating a reality where the prohibitions and the restrictions, the guardrails and the guidelines that are offered by God's word so that we can function in relationship and fellowship with one another. All of these burdens are cast aside and so human beings take on what they believe to be God-like powers. But we would do well as human beings to remember our limitations. Can you create something out of nothing? Can you create a universe? In today's world, people think, if there was a God, then why doesn't he have something to say? And the psalmist says, beware when God opens his mouth. (laughs) Because the moment that God speaks, he speaks to them, look what it says in verse 5, in his wrath, and distresses them in his deep displeasure, a a moment, well, God, if you have something to say, say it now. And the Lord says, there's judgment for the rebel. There's discipline. There's a problem. The psalmist breaks God's silence so that when he speaks in his wrath and distresses them in his deep displeasure, when God finally speaks, it's to create an unprecedented terror in the hearts of the rebels and the apostates. Can you imagine the watching world? Can you imagine a world that wakes up one morning and says, you mean everything that it says in the Bible about Jesus being the Lord and God being the sovereign God of the universe, you mean everything that the Bible said is true? Uh, Yeah. And look what the psalmist has to say. The Lord God has made up his mind. Who is this king? What has God decided about who will rule? The Lord God in heaven says, yet I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I've established the person who I want to rule. 
in the historical context, it's David. In the prophetic context, it is the king of kings. It is the Lord of lords. This is the person that's, that Paul makes reference to in the book of Philippians when he says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. The Lord God has made up his mind. The decision is irrevocable. The decision is certain. Imagine the person says, well, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. We haven't been given any opportunity to provide input into who we want to be the king and the Lord of the universe. Who do you nominate? Well, me. And the Lord God says, no. I've, I've appointed Jesus to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. The psalmist reveals that if you rebel against the Father, you're rebelling against the Son. John Phillips uses this illustration of the French Revolution. He says, quote, modern man is like the French revolutionary who helped storm the Bastille. He had scaled the cathedral of Notre Dame, torn the cross from the spire, dashed it into fragments on the pavement of Paris far below. He said to the peasant, we are going to pull down all that reminds you of God. Citizen, was the calm reply. Then pull down the stars. No, you laugh, but you understand. Pull down the stars. You can, you can pull down a statue. You can tear down the statue of George Washington. You can tear down the statue of, of Thomas Jefferson. You can tear down the, the, the statues of people who have represented uh, our country. You can tear down the statues, but at some point, at some point, you cannot remove the reality that God has created all things. And so the Messiah's special assurance is given in verses 7 through 9. Look what he says. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. God's Messiah is now speaking. Remember we heard the voice of David and then we heard the voice of Almighty God and now the Son speaks and when the Son speaks, he reminds himself of what the Father has said. He, he reminds himself, wait a minute, the Father has said, you are my Son. Today I have begotten you. What this should do for you is remind you that once the Father has spoken to you, you can speak to yourself in your heart and in your mind. God has spoken to me. He's spoken on the subject. He's told me things. And by the way, this passage has caused no end of problems for Bible scholars. They go, well, what are we supposed to understand from this? Well, it may mean that Jesus is, in fact, the eternal Son of God. I think that that's what it means. When he says, this day I have begotten you, the, according to the Bible, when Jesus was asked to teach his disciples to pray, he said, when you pray, pray this way. Say, our Father who art in heaven. By the way, the, God doesn't change. He's always been the father. He will never not be the father. In order to be a father, you have to have a son, an eternal son, a son who has always existed. The father has always existed as the father. The son has always existed as the son. In context, David is poetically relating to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, where the Lord has said, and upon your throne will come a ruler, and, the, and, and again, the scepter isn't going to depart from him. In other words, God has already promised David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, that his offspring will always and forever rule. You know, it's interesting to me that the favorite title that Jesus has of himself is the Son of Man as he identifies with humanity. His second favorite title is the son of David. He is the son of David. 
The Father adds the promise to the Son, ask of me, and I'll give you the goim, the nations, for your inheritance, and the ends of the earth for your possession. The idea being that the Father has said to the Son, would you like to save people in Central and South America? Would you like to save people in Africa? Would you like to save people in Europe, Asia, and Oceania? Are there people on the earth, people groups all over the globe who you want to forgive and reconcile? I will give them to you. But what about the people who stand in opposition? You know what? It's like having a rod of iron and a bunch of clay vessels, and you will pop them. They can't stand. They, 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 the father adds, ask of me. This really rubs the rebel the wrong way. You mean the Lord reserves the right to punish the rebel and subdue the hard-hearted? The answer is yes. And look at the Spirit's supernatural advice, reverence the Son. And so now we go from the voice of David, the voice of the Father, the voice of the Son. But the Holy Spirit is going to say something. Look what it says. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little while, blessed are all those who, who put their trust in him. In other words, the rebel, the disobedient, is going to face wrath and judgment, but the Holy Spirit says, wait! There's another option. There's another option. You don't have to die in your sin. You don't have to perish in your rebellion. You don't have to be disconnected from God forever. The Holy Spirit is going to give you a better option. The voice of the Holy Spirit is heard issuing a surprising invitation. The Holy Spirit urges the kings and the rulers to be wise, to serve the Lord. The Spirit invites the rebel to kiss the Son in an un feigned expression of affection. This is sort of an idiomatic expression when it says kiss the son. You know, in ancient cultures, particularly among Jewish people, even among Arab people, uh, Italian people, Italian people will go, eh, hey, bring it on in, come on here, come here, mm, come on, give me a big hug. You express affection. This is something that you do in certain cultures where they express affection. And that's, when you think of that, you might think of this as reverence. The Bible's antidote to re rebellion is reverence. It begins with wisdom, with instruction, and then service and affection. And so instead of rebellion, he invites wisdom, instruction, service, and rebellion. The Holy Spirit is doing what the Holy Spirit does, inviting people to turn from their sin, to, to turn to, to the Savior, to lay down their arms and their disobedience, Rebellion will bring certain destruction. Reverence and submission will bring safety and happiness and a meaningful life and unlimited blessing. And so the Holy Spirit calls the world to repentance. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit knows what the world itself does not know, that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And so for the people who want to write off the people in China ride off the people in Africa, ride off the people in Central and South America. Who cares? Who cares? Who cares? God cares. He's not willing to ride them off. He wants all to come to a saving knowledge of the truth. We're all familiar with with the fact that the United States of America dropped two nuclear bombs on Nagasaki and Hiroshima in World War II. A couple of weeks ago, I was in New Mexico at my son's church, at Anthony's church in, in Rio Doso. And in order to get there, there's two ways. You can go from the north or you can come from the south. And if you come from the south, you go through that area where the first atomic bomb was exploded. 
What many people don't know is that before the bombs were dropped in Japan, 70 million pamphlets were dropped. 70 million pamphlets were dropped. There's a judgment coming. Run for your life. What is about to take place could kill you. We have to do this because recalcitrant individuals refuse to surrender. And rather than risk killing the lives of millions of Americans and allied troops, we're going to have to have an expression of profound discipline. 70 million pamphlets were dropped, and it went unheeded. Over and over again, Bibles are opened, sermons are preached, the Holy Spirit says, turn from your sin, turn to the Savior, kiss the Son, the world was introduced to Jesus a long time ago, but the world hasn't seen the last of Jesus. According to the Bible, Jesus is coming back. And so the Holy Spirit spells out the terms of peace and amnesty, and the offer is real, but the offer is temporary. You won't have time to negotiate a settlement if in fact you perish in the way, we will face the Son. And so remember Jesus in the New Testament was asked by one of the religious leaders, what must I do to work the works of God? And his answer was, you should believe in the one that God has sent. Why is it so hard? William MacDonald writes, for man to trust his creator is the most sane and logical and reasonable thing that he can do. On the other hand, to disbelieve and defy the Almighty is about as irrational a thing as a person can do, unquote. And look what it says in verse 12. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. That word trust in the Old Testament is very much like the New Testament word that we use to translate believe, and faith. The word appears some 154 times in the Old Testament, and it's a rendering of a Hebrew word that signifies to take or to, to trust or to, to take refuge in Psalm chapter 2, verse 12, to lean on in Psalm 56, 3, to roll on in Psalm 22, 8. In the New Testament, in the most famous passage in all of the Bible where it says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him wouldn't perish. The word believe is pistis. It means to trust in, to rely on, to cling to. Spurgeon said, trust Jesus and you're saved. Trust yourself, and you're lost. Dwight Moody, Dwight Moody famously said, trust in yourself, and you are doomed to disappointment. Trust in your friends, and they will die and leave you. This is true. I celebrated my 50th high school reunion, and some of us, a lot of us weren't there. Trust in money and you may have it taken away from you. Trust in reputation and some slanderous tongue will blast it. But trust in God and you're never to be confounded in time or eternity. Are you shaking your fist at God? Are you defying him? Turn from your sin. Lay down your arm. Kiss the sun. Ooh.